All right, well, it looks like we are ready to go. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you that uh, have just joined us, welcome. Those of you that are just logging in, I'm sure you're gonna get settled in and have a great time. Uh, welcome to you if you're just logging in. Um, so it's we're totally thrilled to have you all join us today. Uh, we're going to be focusing on Canadian innovation, <laughs> solutions, challenges, and most importantly, the relationship between industry, cities, local governments, national governments, and trade organizations. So really kind of talking about the Canadian ecosystem and how all of the great work that they're done is applicable across the world. All of these solutions have been, uh, you know, tested and implemented at a local level, and I believe uh, that they are scaling and ready to scale. So I'm excited to showcase everybody today and thanks for joining us. Um, today, we're gonna really spotlight some of the organizations that are really, you know, moving the needle uh, for Canada. And so I think, you know, you wanna take good notes, get to know these organizations, get to know the people behind them and the municipal leaders that are kind of driving our cities forward. So make sure that you're paying close attention and uh, you save your questions to the end because we're gonna have a great conversation. Uh, just as a quick housekeeping, um, we're gonna do Q&A at the end. Uh, if you wanna drop them in the Q&A section or if you wanna, you know, if you have a specific question to one of our panelists, you can feel free to drop, drop it in the chat. Uh, but before we do that, I do wanna acknowledge and thank our partners, Global Affairs Canada, for helping organize uh, this webinar series with us, with Smart Cities Council. And uh, I want to especially acknowledge Trade Commissioner Dakota Korth for being a part of this series. We're on our third session now. It's our final one. We're going to go out with the bang and we're super excited to talk. Um, so there's going to be a lot of good conversations. Um, I also want to acknowledge and recognize our panelists and speakers today. So we got Dan Mathers, who's the co-founder, president and CEO of 11X. Mark Majewski, the Director of Strategic Alliances uh, from Loco Locomobi World. Uh, Mike Dench, who's the Vice President of Marketing for Myovision. Uh, and Brent, Brent Ives, the Director of Information Systems from Spruce Grove, uh, Alberta. And before we get to our discussion, I just want to hand it over to Dakota to say a couple of words and get us started. Thanks, Elby. Wonderful to be here for this final iteration of our three-part series and a really warm welcome to everybody who's joining us today from all over the world. Um, as Albie said, my name is Dakota Korth. I'm a trade commissioner with Global Affairs Canada, uh, and I'm based out of the Canadian consulate in Detroit, Michigan in the US. Uh, I think the third time's the charm with all of our messaging. So just a quick reminder that the trade commissioner service helps businesses and communities grow and thrive all over the world through our network of experts working to assist you guys to assist companies, municipalities of all stripes uh, in finding new products and ideas and finding new suppliers, networking with new partners, and basically in finding new opportunities for growth. And because, you know, reading the news, trade conflicts seem to regularly be in the headlines somewhere, uh, just a quick reminder that Canada has free trade agreements that cover well over 50 countries uh, and support much more than a trillion dollars in trade globally. So our mindset really is that we're all in this together, and for us to succeed, we want to help each of you succeed. And that's why we worked to develop this webinar series to highlight some of the best applications and advancements in smart cities technologies, see who's been implementing them and hear directly from those on both sides. As this is the last webinar of this series, uh, this is the first one that I've been involved with that the TCS has sponsored with Smart Cities Council. So I'd like to make a quick plug here for those of you that are on um, and even for those of you that are participating for your thoughts and your input afterwards. Um, we've had some great conversations. I've had some great conversations with participants and speakers after the first two webinars. And I think we've struck a chord with this approach. Uh, so I'd say, please reach out to me or any of the Smart Cities Council folks with your thoughts, your ideas on what worked, topics you'd like to see covered next or anything that might be useful. And of course, if you found some beneficial networking um, or some customers or anything else that you think might help us uh, pitch to continue this series, please let me know. With that said, I, I really wanna echo Albie's thanks to today's speakers, Dan, Mark, Mike, and Brent for your time particularly and for the insights that we're gonna get from you today. So thank you all. Again, let's, well, uh, let's remember to thank Connie Heath with Smart Cities Council for her efforts wrestling all of us and getting this all together. Uh, we would definitely not have gotten this done if she hadn't been working diligently. 
And again, thanks, Albie, for agreeing to put the series on your shoulder and uh, guide us through the last of our third, our three sessions. And uh, with that, I'll give it back to you, Albie, and thank you all again. Awesome. Thanks, Dakota. Well, my job was easy. All I have to do is host. The heavy lift was, was Connie, definitely. So shout out to Connie and the entire team at Smart Cities Council. Um, that being said, I'll be your host today. I'll be guiding the discussion. My name is Albie Bocanegra, future in residence futurist in residence for Smart Cities Council, uh, formerly Chief Technology Officer for the City of New York and Vice President of Global Tech and City Partnerships at MasterCard uh, and former Municipal Executive at the City of San Francisco. So that just says I've been around the block. And so I, I'm excited to guide the conversation. And with that, I do wanna hand it over to Dan uh, to share a little bit about the great work that they've done at 11X. Dan, over to you. Fantastic, thank you, Aldi. I'll uh, just share my screen here. There you go. Hey, hopefully everyone can uh, see that. Uh, there we go. All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Dan Mathers. I'm the uh, president and CEO of 11X, and uh, we're a smart parking technology company. Uh, we're global, but we're operating mostly in North America right now. Uh, and uh, basically, I wanted to talk a little bit today about uh, how cities can utilize data to transform parking and mobility and really to get a whole bunch of uh, progress towards meeting uh, your smart city objectives. You know, when you, uh, one second here, there we go. Um, so, you know, what are the key smart city drivers, right? You want to optimize operational efficiency, improve quality of life for your residents and visitors. Uh, you want to support local economic development and support your sustainability objectives. Um, you know, with most of these smart city uh, uh, projects and, and, and uh, approaches, you're getting two benefits. You're getting a financial ROI, ideally, as well as a social ROI. And uh, because smart parking technology is one of the only areas that actually makes significant impact on all four of the key goals that define smart communities, uh, the technology is really taking off very aggressively and very rapidly uh, with, with huge growth uh, uh, factors. So, you know, the reality is parking's a pain. 30% uh, of downtown traffic is from people looking for parking. Um, Curbside, it's becoming way more congested due to Uber, Amazon, many other new users. Um, and really, drivers are getting increasingly frustrated as they spend, you know, on average 10 to 20 minutes to find a parking spot. In some cities, such as uh, Manhattan, it's actually uh, 107 hours a year uh, that people spend looking for parking. If you imagine that, that's like three or four 24 hour days. Um, and, you know, this. Cruising and looking for parking accounts for 430,000 metric tons of CO2 emissions every day. It's a huge traffic safety issue. You know, you find that parking spot, you slam on the brakes, cause an accident or, you know, worse, hit cyclists and that sort of stuff. And to top it all off, uh, you know, greater than 30% of people don't pay. And because it's so expensive to enforce, only 5% get caught. So it's just a huge, huge impact. And, you know, the problem is that today's parking management approaches just don't work. You know, the first experience you have in a city is the parking experience. It's a big brand issue. Finding a parking spot, traffic congestion, it really, you know, in many cases reduces the interest in visiting uh, that city uh, for surrounding areas. Um, and it all comes down to when you get 85% of stall occupancy, you get gridlock. This is stall occupancy on the streets, uh, surface lots, and uh, and to some extent in parking garages as well. And so, you know, the, the cost to build new parking garages is prohibitive. And it's really just covering for inefficiencies uh, that require an overcapacity to be built. Um, and in addition, enforcement is, is very inefficient. So the focus areas are really to understand the utilization and availability of parking and demand. In many cities, 
there's more than enough parking. Uh, it's just that it's a street or two over. Uh, it's not necessarily on that main thoroughfare that people are driving up and down finding that parking or that one block that they continually circle. Um, as you add more and more specialty stalls, such as EV charging stations, uh, access to those becomes important. How do you know whether or not there's a, uh, a combustion engine, internal combustion engine vehicle parked in that stall and uh, taking up, uh, uh, you know, space um, where they shouldn't be? Uh, improved curbside management and, of course, uh, paid parking and paid compliance. Um, uh, Slide there. there we go. Um, so again, you look at a city, there's parking garages, there's surface lots, there's curbside, and you really need to address all of these to be able to solve the problem. So the solution is getting real-time uh, technology and accurate data uh, on a real-time basis. This enables municipalities to make data-driven decisions about, you know, their core uh, districts in terms of parking and mobility. It really lets drivers, you know, it starts with drivers understanding where the available parking is and being guided to those spaces, either through digital signage, uh, website access, um, and uh, mo uh, mobile apps. Uh, and this reduces congestion due to circling and searching, balances the use for all spaces, improves safety, and supports the sustainability goals by people not uh, using that 30% of vehicle uh, of drive time hours uh, searching for parking. So the goal with all of this stuff is really to make sure that uh, you can find a parking spot anywhere, anytime that you want to. And this is possible. It's been proven over and over again uh, that if you keep occupancy on any one block face at 60% or lower, everyone can find a parking spot whenever they want. So how do you do that? You guide drivers to the uh, parking spot uh, very quickly and easily. Uh, you also give tools to the city. Uh, and this, I won't go into detail here, but the uh, parking uh, managers really love this stuff in terms of uh, data. Uh, and business intelligence on how to manage their and, and predict their occupancy requirements. Um, and it all and then on top of that, it all starts with uh, managing driver behavior. So but to start, but to get there, you really need stall occupancy sensors. You need to know what's happening in each stall on the street, in the parking lots, uh, in the surface lots, in the parking garages. And it needs to be very, very accurate. It needs to be reliable and zero maintenance. Uh, it needs to be easily deployed, cost effective, excelling in any environment. Uh, so, you know, in, in read, you know, in terms of where snow plows are and uh, cold weather climates needs to be buried completely beneath the surface of the pavement, not flush, but completely beneath. And our, you know, our sensor is uh, covered with uh, epoxy. Uh, it has to be wireless so that you're not running uh, cables everywhere, very expensive. And it has to have a 10 year battery life for to get the, a good ROI. Um, so uh, we found that stall occupancy sensors for individual stalls is the best all around solution and is also the least expensive. So just talking a little bit more about the solution, you've got a car goes over the sensor, sends a data to our purpose-built wireless network. We use LoRaWAN uh, and for that, and uh, it backhauls using cellular into the cloud. This is very useful because there are many, many smart city applications that also run on LoRaWAN. Uh, and then into the cloud to go to our business intelligence software, uh, APIs to connect with other uh, vendors software, um, and then of course, uh, uh, digital signage to guide people to the nearest app uh, spot. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, compliance uh, and enforcement. Uh, compliance is a big one uh, because again, when people don't comply with the parking rules, particularly if you think about it, some cities don't have paid parking, but they do have like Guelph, for example, two hour maximum time limits. And when people don't comply with that and they can't enforce, it contributes to traffic. So just a couple more slides here talking about, you know, our integrated parking platform. Uh, we deliver financial and social ROI through an improved parking experience. Um, and there's many, many different attributes. I've talked about some of these already, but 
what happens once you, you know, have tried to guide people to stalls and they still want to circle that block? Well, you give them financial incentive through demand-based pricing. And that's all part of uh, the platform as well. Uh, and, you know, you make it cheaper to park on off street uh, if they're willing to walk a little bit and a little more expensive uh, on, the, uh, on the main block faces, uh, as well as uh, curbside management tools. So uh, we've had some fantastic uh, customer deployments. Um, a couple of them are highlighted here. I'm not going to talk about Spruce Grove, Alberta, because uh, Brent is going to talk about that uh, in detail next, but uh, very, very successful partnership there. Uh, Oakville, Ontario, it's a community of about 220,000 people. Uh, and again, wanted to have data collection to understand their parking, improve the, the parking balance and real-time stall availability and signage. Uh, Kirkland, Washington, uh, just finished a deployment there um, where they want to understand parking usage. Again, balance the needs with the current stalls and use accurate information to uh, create their parking policies. And then finally, Guelph, uh, Ontario. Um, and, uh, you know, I mentioned that they wanted compliance. Very important when you are you don't pay for parking like they do, like, like in Guelph. So this is just a sampling of uh, the deployments. Very happy to talk to anybody or answer any questions. Um, just wanted to finally talk about Arlington County, Virginia. This is almost a twin city to Oakville, uh, about 220,000 people. Um, and uh, they are doing the most significant performance parking project in recent history. Uh, key goals there include uh, reduced traffic, improving the parking experience, uh, reduction in greenhouse gases, and also something that's been proven with this type of technology where you can have stall uh, sensing, stall occupancy sensing and, and driving demand-based pricing. Uh, those communities that have deployed this find that they are able to lower their average parking prices, but increase their parking revenues. Uh, and so the contract was awarded to us in the fall of 22. We're just uh, in the middle of the implementation phase now. It's quite a large project, uh, 5,000 sensors in the metro corridors, and it's really uh, the full software stack in, in, in the field there and in action, including the business intelligence dashboard, navigation, wayfinding, uh, mobile app, uh, dynamic pricing, and, uh, and curbside management. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much for listening and uh, uh, back to you, Albie. Uh, and uh, yeah, so thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, Brent as well. Awesome, Dan. Fantastic. I love the point, the data point that you provided about parking or the way that parking is accessible is your first impression of a city. So I think everyone on this call can kind of relate to that when you like kind of arrived, especially if you're a road tripper like me and you're trying to get, you know, to the central business district and grab a bite to eat, uh, you know, go shop if you're missing some, some stuff before you check into your hotel, anything or checking into your hotel and you're trying to kind of find off street parking. Uh, it's super important, but most more than anything, I think what ties in directly to that is economic impact, right? Because if you can park somewhere, then you know, you're know you closer to shops and restaurants, et cetera, so then you can consume and then you're able to contribute to the local economy. So there's a direct correlation, I think, between uh, not just uh, the, the, the part of urban mobility that relates to how people get around, but also around a city, but also how people, once you're out of your vehicle, how you can participate in that city and the facility between, you know, the ease of use between being in your vehicle to being parked and getting to your destination and being being able to participate in the economy there is super important. And I'm glad that that was one of the highlights and one of the key components uh, for Spruce Grove. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Brent to tell us a little bit about, you know, how you partnered with, how Spruce Grove partnered with 11X and essentially other things that they're focusing on that are exciting. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Brent. Great. Thanks a lot for having me. I enjoyed watching the first two sessions and I'm uh, honored to be part of the third session. Uh, so I'm Brent. I'm the director of the IT department at the city of Spruce Grove. I've been working for the city for close to three years now. I have uh, 30 years of experience in IT, uh, partnering with business units to implement and leverage technology. I worked in the private sector and in the public sector uh, for several companies, including telecommunication companies, utility companies, 
innovation company that was responsible for investing in research and outcomes and a global company that sold smart fare solutions to transit agencies. So I've been both a customer and a vendor throughout my career. My passion is operational efficiency and giving the business the data they need to make and defend and form decisions. So working for the city gives me great exposure to all the different business units we have and I'm thrilled to be working here. Uh, the city of Spruce Grove is in the province of Alberta. We're 11 kilometers west of the provincial capital of Edmonton and just over 300 kilometers from Jasper for those of you who like to ski. Uh, we're a growing city with an expected population of 40,000 once our census completes this year. There'll be an increase of 5,000 residents since 2018. We're a family oriented community with the largest population being adults aged 30 to 34 years of age followed by 35 to 39, and then children under five. So we're, we're a young community. As a result, we offer substantial recreation and culture programs and services. We're building an additional civic center within the city set to open in 2025. And we have over 40 kilometers of integrated trail systems within the city. I always joke with the vendors who wanna to come to visit us in Spruce Grove that they should fill up on fuel when they're here because it's often 20 cents a liter cheaper than in Edmonton. Uh, it was $1.25 when I came in today. So it's just another benefit of living in the city of Spruce Grove. So the city has been on and remains uh, on the smart city journey. Uh, this isn't just a journey for the city. It's for our residents and businesses as well. We just completed a two year project. We're now over 90% of city residents and businesses have access to gigabit enabled fiber to the premise. So this offers a variety of services to them, including high speed internet. Uh, within our business units within the city, the smart city initiatives included things such as autonomous mowers and snow clearing equipment, autonomous line painting devices, environmental monitoring, traffic safety, people counting for planning hours of operations, some stormwater monitoring solutions, and ways for residents to report issues. But uh, as Dan and Albie have mentioned, the one project I'd like to focus on today is the parking monitoring. So the city of Spruce Grove, uh, was undertaking a city center redevelopment plan, which included a parking management plan, as well as streetscaping with the intended outcome being a safe and improved experiences, uh, experience for those who walk, bike, drive, or use transit. The Downtown Business Association has worked closely with the city on the plans to improve the area for both the residents and the businesses. These changes will include expanding the areas business have to conduct business, basically onto the sidewalks in places, and a new street design will accommodate for that. City center parking availability has always been a point of discussion. Uh, some stating there isn't enough parking, others stating there's always availability, and there were concerns on many sides that uh, these street changes would, would hamper parking. Developers and business owners have approached the city in the past to change the bylaws with respect to how much parking is required when it comes to building and developing, as some felt the city was requesting too many parking spaces for the building sizes. Mm -hmm. Uh, parking studies were completed in the past, but those only show, showcased a point in time and a better solution was required. Uh, kind of as you know, Dan mentioned, you know, we really needed the ongoing parking data. So in the summer of 2021, we piloted uh, 11X's technology and deployed 20 of their in-ground parking monitors in the city center so that real time and historical data could be captured and leveraged. Uh, important to note was we developed a city communication plan around the pilot. Uh, so we had updates on our website, but we gave a letter to each of the businesses in the pilot area detailing the pilot, the installation timelines, the impact of the parking that day, uh, what data we were collecting and why. The Downtown Business Association was provided updates as well as to the goal of our pilot. Full transparency was the key. 11X installed and configured the sensors and parking stalls were reopened quickly, limiting the impact of parking to only a few hours in some cases. And immediately the city had real time and historical data detailing the number of vehicles, the entry time, the exit time from our parking spaces. No privacy concerns as nothing about the vehicle is captured, no safety concerns, no impact of street cleaning or snow clearing as the sensors were installed right in the road as, as Dan mentioned. The pilot was successful. Data for the pilot area was put into an easy to consume monthly email that went to all joint leadership team for the city, as well as key individuals in the engineering planning uh, planning and development and economic development teams. These emails included the number of vehicles parked, the average parking duration, maximum parking duration, month over month parking usage, turnover. Uh, we shared a lot of data and that was one of the lessons learned is uh, we shared maybe too much. <laughs> 
in the winter uh, of 2022. So before the session started, we were talking about uh, how cold the winters can get. Uh, the city engaged 11X to outfit three blocks of on-street parking stalls, so both parallel and angled parking, expanding our pilot area to include three zones now. That same communication plan was leveraged and impacted businesses were notified of the installation schedule. schedule. They were given details on the technology, the results of the pilot, no negative feedback was received. Uh, snow clearing of the road was completed and installation occurred successfully even in the cold weather. Uh, to date, over 7 million minutes of parking has been captured with 157,000 vehicles uh, parking. We have that exact breakdown by spot. In a previous session, uh, the question was asked about uh, how much data is too much. We built a large number of Power BI reports for the business units at the city showcasing a variety of things when it comes to parking. Some of the businesses, uh, business units never thought of using this data, though, so it's been great to see them awaken to the art of the possible. Being able to form businesses and the Downtown Business Association, for example, how many vehicles parked on the night of a specific event and how long is data that can help them. They never had that in the past. Uh, but you can overwhelm uh, some users, so it's best to understand what it is they need for reporting and deliver that first. Uh, one of the um, best examples we have, though, is uh, now we have a picture. So instead of Excel spreadsheets of, of data of, for the parking availability, we can show a picture that shows each spot and, the, and uh, how long vehicles were parked. So it, it quickly tells the story. The monthly reports of not just the data, but the story that that data shows are easily generated using the data 11X provides. And we continue to send that to all business units monthly. Our planning and development team leveraged that data to take a bylaw change to city council to adjust the parking requirements to one spot per 85 square meters from 55 square meters, essentially allowing for larger buildings to be built, which can translate into additional tax revenue for the city, more employees for businesses while not jeopardizing the parking. Giving city council the data to make an informed decision wouldn't have been possible without this solution. When city council was deliberating on the bylaw change, one question was asked of city administration and how the city would monitor that this change doesn't impact parking in the years to come. And the parking monitoring solution was the answer to that question. Having to the second parking data for all stalls would ensure the city can monitor the usage and ensure parking is used efficiently for years to come. The 11X solution offers alerting capability, which we use not to enforce our parking time limits currently, but we do use it for vehicles who park for an extended period of time. The city is deploying the 11X parking monitors with our electric vehicle chargers uh, that are being installed for public use on city property. Um, we feel that there will be some diesel trucks parked in the uh, hockey rink uh, uh, electric vehicle stations and we'll, we'll, we'll know that uh, with the combined electric vehicle charging and the 11X uh, monitoring. Uh, 11X is also facilitating, facilitating discussions with electronic signage providers as the city looks to expose to the public where parking is available to help direct the drivers to spaces quickly and with on-street signage. Uh, Dan had an example of that. We see these uh, signs can also be used for business advertising, parking bans, heat alerts. There's several use cases we're looking at, so not just for parking directions. As the city center redevelopment works concludes this year, the city will be engaging 11X one more time to outfit the newly designed street to monitor parking. So essentially we'll have the entire city center, center parking monitored. 11X has been a great partner in this space. They're not just a smart city vendor, in my opinion. They've been a true partner for the city and they remain committed to us being successful. And I'd like to thank them for that. That's all I have, Albie. No, fantastic. Great no, questions. Oh, sorry, talked over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds like you know the the city of Spruce Grove really, you know, not only did they find a really great partner for the right problem, but actually created like this two way street of communication, of good partnership, of kind of setting expectations and standards, and taking all of the information and all the data that was produced by that and providing it to the community and more importantly, the small business community, which is essentially the backbone of all of our cities, right? And so when I was giving the example earlier about the, the impact of the economic impact of being able to secure a spot and being able to contribute to the local economy is super important. And the biggest stakeholder there, I would say is our small businesses, right? Because they are, they, you know, they are not just contributors in terms of tax revenue, but they are employers, 
Uh, they provide goods and services that are necessary to keep a city uh, vibrant and, and um, uh, you know, investment worthy and able to be like visited properly. So I just want to, you know, commend you all on not just making yourselves, uh, you know, finding the right problem and finding the right solutions, but as a city, making yourselves workable for an industry partner, because I think that sometimes is the challenge, right, is you have a great solution as an industry partner, but you don't, the city doesn't always find the right ways and mechanisms to work together, uh, and sometimes there's really, there's big hurdles to overcome, so, you know, kudos to both of you all, both organizations for a job well done, and there's a lot of good learnings there. We'll get into the Q&A a, a little more because I do want to get some best practices and, you know, get share some advice from, from the experience of working together. But before we do that, I want to hand it over to Mark uh, to talk a little bit about, uh, it, look, look, I, can't, I can't pronounce that today, Locomobi uh, World and uh, what you're doing there. And just making sure everybody can see that. Are we good? Excellent. Hey, thank you, Brent, and thank you, Dan, because uh, uh, you set the stage nicely, and I'll try to continue on with that stage and not repeat some of the information. So Locomobi is a mobility company, but we specialize in parking, tolling, access, and data analytics, uh, connecting many other different technologies, including PUCs, uh, similar to 11X, to really create the solution. This is a logo soup of some of our customers. And you can see from this, we have developers, hotels, casinos, airports, ports, cities, police. And we're one of the 30 fastest growing companies in North America, capturing at least one customer per week. So when you look at smart cities, you can't have a smart city without smart mobility. You can't have smart ability without smart energy. All of these things are connected. So unless you share your APIs and get APIs from other parts of the cities, the value really isn't unlocked. What we do is connect all these data sets to really give you great business models and kind of taking from what Brent said is, you know, take data warehouses and turn them into knowledge factories, start publishing this information. That being said, Dan did a great job. And yes, 30%, 40% of all traffic is caused by parking. People want it to be frictionless. People want it to be efficient and people want it to be safe. 30% of all crimes happen in parking lots. So our visioneering in our company created WorldStream. WorldStream is our own cloud of which we connect all our systems and other people's systems too to get live data all the time. So whether it's an apartment, a condo, whether it's an airport, whether it's an existing parking lot, whether it's an app to change um, behavior, all of these things feed into WorldStream and WorldStream does everything in real time. And that's kind of important with cities, things like parking, there's no such thing as batching. As soon as someone pays for it, you know it, everything is live. And you can do this from a beach in Jamaica if you want, because it's all on a secure cloud. Our solution is slightly different than Dan's. What we use is AI and we use vision recognition, not LPR. So when we look at a license plate, our accuracy rates are incredible because we're taking many, many pictures and not just taking the plate, taking artifacts around the plate and on the car to create a fingerprint of the car. And once you do that and go onto our cloud and put in your license plate and your credit card and your cell phone number, suddenly you don't need even your phone anymore. What happens is the car becomes your wallet. You drive in, it knows that you've dr driven in, you drive out, you've paid for it. You don't have to stop, you don't have to get out, you don't have to go on an app. You don't need to do anything. A simple on-ground system is the blue triangle is the camera looking in. It picks up the license plate of the car coming in. You don't just know that the stall is full. You know whether that person has paid. The yellow is people that haven't paid. You, this information is fed live to your monitoring center or can be just set with algorithms to set notes. When officers should come out to, to ticket when more than a certain amount of cars haven't paid. Plus these cameras need to be used. You don't want an asset that only does one thing. 
So we allow the city to look at these cameras to look, has the snow being removed? Has the garbage being removed? Do you wanna count people? Do you want to do other things with our cameras? Because they're there and they're on all the time. This is now an on street parking situation where the city of Oakville now wants to get rid of all of their parking meters. And so again, the license plate of the car is picked up. A Hawkeye camera sees that vehicle, puts a box around it, knows whether it drove through or did it park. And if it parked, you just park, walk in, and your parking has been paid for. There is no such thing as looking for a meter anymore or doing any of those things. And we also share this information with the city. So you can see there's a park off to the side. We can count people with the camera or vehicles and start telling the city when they need to collect the garbage from the park. Not that it's Tuesday, but so many people have actually gone down that sidewalk. When we take that live information and we feed it to a good user information, what happens is you can have live screens either internally or externally as to how full are your lots. Because your revenues are live, how is your revenue doing? And do you need to adjust something? And if you take the history of the lot and, and also put in weather and put in the calendar, suddenly you can start predicting how busy will your parking lot be? At what time will the parking be busy? All of this information helps build the knowledge. This is a real life example on the left of a city that has a very large parking lot for transit. And what we did using privacy by, de by design is we showed them from every zip code or postal code, where did the cars come from to go to that parking lot? That allows the city to put in direct busing, express buses, look at roads. They can dice it as to what time that happened, when it happened, and they start getting real life information, not just about parking, but how everybody moved into that parking. And to the right, you can then start heat mapping to say what parking lots are full, not just yours, all the parking lots. What's happening? Where are those people coming from? All of this creates incredible knowledge. And that knowledge can be fed into an automatic um, enforcement system, which we can do by cell phone. We have our own little robot. We use Google Glasses. We have a little QR code that you take a picture of and suddenly you get the high definition pictures, your GPS location, everything that you can pay the fine quickly. We also working with customers realize that we need to build economic development. So what we do with a, a part of our system called MoveB is in the city of Kitchener, population 300,000, when you buy a ticket for the theater, you also get a note to say, do you wanna park? You put in your license plate, it will tell you, you have a reserve spot at lot three. As you pull into lot three, you'll get a note to your phone saying, these are your local vendors that will help you pay with parking. $5 if you have dinner here, $2 if you have a coffee there. It drives the customers into the places of business. And we even share this with the bus people. So if you tap and go downtown, some of the businesses will pay for your transit if you've had a coffee there. Um, we also do one and two factor authentication into airports and police stations so that you never need to leave the cab of your vehicle. You never roll down your window. You never do anything to get outside of your vehicle. You can go in and out very securely. And from this information, you get license plates, which are public knowledge. You get a live report that you can dice to know who's allowed in, who's not allowed in, opening gates, closing gates. You can do audits of plates, which plates are in there more often, which are less. And we've actually found this a great help when police come because a Cadillac converter was stolen. We can tell them what cars came in and out around that period. When there was a violent crime, all of this information, they can know the, the, the license plates. So I hope that helps you kind of get a little hint of what Locomobi World is doing. Please visit our website. We have lots of eBooks podcasts or contact us directly. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mark. Well, I mean, I think Locomobi World is providing 
multiple solutions to multiple challenges. I really like the safety and security component and giving the cities access to that. I'm a big fan of not putting more devices and more hardware out unless you have to. So finding more than one purpose for things that you already have out. So giving cities access to the camera footage and being able to see that in real time, I think is going to provide a lot of value in terms of safety and security uh, and even just good public information that's out there. So uh, the visualization tool also looks really good. And I'm, I'm sure that cities are truly benefiting from that. The mapping uh, the, the mapping service also looks really, really interesting. I'm thinking of it from even from a uh, economic development and travel and tourism component to be able to know where the heavy traffic is coming from uh, so they can kind of secure billboards, marketing, different tools that they can use to drive business into the downtown or just any kind of city corridor. So a lot of good work happening there. So uh, yeah, great work at Locomobile World happening. Um, and then now to take us home, uh, we're gonna talk to Mike uh, from Myovision. So Mike, take it away. All right, and here we go. So in the home front, thanks to everybody for setting the stage for I think what should be a, a relatively complimentary story uh, from myself and on behalf of the team at Myovision. We're a roughly 20 year old company, um, global in nature. Uh, we started in 2005 with a temporary solution pictured on the left. And our current CEO and our founder, Curtis McBride, uh, used to sit in cars, if you recall, usually a late model Honda Civic or Toyota Corolla as an engineering student and counting cars. And after what he tells us was about the first 30 minutes, the quality and quantity of cars counted um, to, you know, certainly went down. And from there, kind of set out this course to think about traffic counting, detection, and monitoring as a as a way to potentially better optimize that. And the other convention that you might see in the market are road tubes, uh, which are installed over the ground, um, inconsistent quality as it relates to the inability to capture or count pedestrians or bikes or multimodal traffic uh, or larger or smaller vehicles. So this is really kind of how we set this course. And from there, folks that we were installing these um, solutions around the world um, started to come to us and say, why don't you set this thing up permanently and put it uh, as a part of our permanent infrastructure? And that really started to set the course into our journey from a traditional traffic organization into a ITS and into a disruptive player in this space. This is what I would call our McDonald's uh, metrics. So over this period of time, we've counted over 30 billion vehicles roughly 1.5 billion pedestrians, over 23 million hours analyzed. And we're at present operating uh, our technology in 68 countries worldwide. We have five offices around the world. Uh, I think it was also said to kind of start off, like what are the things that we give back? What are the outcomes and, and impacts that we deliver back in, in really clean, cleaner, cleaner, safer, and if more efficient communities are what we're trying to deliver back. And as you can imagine, idling vehicles, and it was said earlier, idle, idling vehicles, whether in a parking lot or on a street, are con contributing uh, greenhouse gases and burning carbon. So how can we help to move those vehicles more efficiently? Uh, um, and the data that we have on file is that it, we, we know that our intersections reduce greenhouse gases in the neighborhood of 200 tons per intersection per year. We just recently made an acquisition uh, called GTT. Um, they're a, a figurehead within the transit and in the emergency um, space for both preemption and prioritization. So this means if a bus is sitting at an intersection, we can also help to communicate that bus to the intersection to encourage the light to change, getting folks to move more effectively. So the visual here is a typical intersection. Uh, usually it's a cabinet, um, you know, obviously a typical uh, green, yellow, and red light. And what is affectionately almost an egg timer, um, setting the, the course of your time on road and your ability to get to and from traffic. So we see this as a starting point to say, what else can we do once we plug this um, 5G supercomputer essentially at an intersection? You can see that we can start to count, monitor, and assess various different things, communicating to different sources. And ultimately, also bringing in and out of um, that various different things like the vehicle detection, so helping emergency vehicles get to where they need to go faster. Um, so, you know, the, the way that you see this in some of our communities today is when 
an ambulance or a fire truck is heading towards an intersection, lights are going, folks don't see that they're actually trying to preempt the intersection. Sometimes and many times accidents occur on their way to another accident. So how can we help those emergency vehicles have the right of way and get a green light? And all of those things also set up delivering back greenhouse gas assessments and being able to deliver an objective outcome when organizations say, we wanna be sustainable, we wanna be green, we help them to create an objective tool for them to say, we've um, decreased the overall carbon or greenhouse gas in our community by way of these um, impacts and ultimately allowing them to potentially unlock even uh, new revenue around carbon credits. Third-party vendors are also integral. And I know, Alba, you talked about kind of how do you do this from public, private, as well as industry partners, we don't get the opportunity to do this on our own. Uh, we have a number of different partners that help to plug these things in, but also complement our stack as well. And these are some of the, you know, some of the names that we use and are really proud of um, partnering with from our perspective. And you can kind of see how this manifests itself. So once we actually start capturing video, on the left, this looks like a typical video, maybe uh, in a video game uh, alternate universe. But you can kind of see that there's actually a lot of really sophisticated technology happening, measuring uh, foot pattern, measuring speed, velocity, encroachment. And once we start to do that, we can actually bring that into this, um, affectionately a computer, speak to the cloud, send it back to traffic data to aggregate, let it learn and move that back to the intersection to make real time improvements. And ultimately those things can be reducing uh, or increasing um, light at a particular intersection to allow pedestrians to move more effectively. And we see this as a multimodal opportunity rather than just say vehicular traffic. So folks on pedestrian, um, scooters, bikes, and all types of transit. And the proxy that we've kind of started to th think about is once we put this computer at the intersection, we see this as the possibility of turning it into a smartphone. And I think it was said earlier by Mark that, you know, our agencies and cities, some of the folks that might be tuning in today don't want to buy um, the Rolodex, the fax machine, the encyclopedia for their desk, essentially. They want more utility out of um, some of their platforms. And that's really how we have set a course to say we want to be the most uh, friendly, integrated platform in this space, allowing us to build, buy, or third-party API in the other tools or questions or solutions that those agencies are looking to um, deliver uh, to their constituents and to their communities. So it becomes a smartphone in the intersection. And many of you probably don't even know where your DSLR is and the camera that's on your phone is adequate and far exceeds some of that. So we see by bringing those technologies together, this becomes a really power, powerful visual and analog for our business as well, that we're looking to translate the intersection specification today from an egg timer, from a 30-year-old spec into something that can be more uh, scalable, allowing those communities to grow. We just re recently wrapped attending the ITSA conference down in Dallas and announced MyoVision 1, which we knew that we were bringing in lots of different ways to solve different problems. So it was safety studies on the right. It was adaptive or detection signal controlling, uh, performance mobility reports. Some of it was built. We had various different experiences. And under MyoVision 1, we really see this as a single sign-on uh, one experience that various different players within an agency, third party, can actually take advantage of. So just represented on this slide, you might see transit being reflected. You might see police, fire, and emergency response being uh, reflected, as well as transit, transportation, green, and mobility. And I think that's one of those key elements that we talked about as it relates to how do these things actually get off the ground. Usually it's when the folks within, say, a Peterborough in this case, and in, in the example I'm about to wrap up with, the folks in transportation are actually communicating the folks in transit and they're fo they're, they are connecting to those folks across the hall in emergency. And that's really where the power and the utility and the outcomes become very robust. And for those that know, Peterborough, Ontario is just outside of Toronto. It's considered kind of a prototypical, perfect example of a city where you can test, learn, and iterate. It's isolated enough from the big city. It's large enough that there's enough data. And Peterborough saw some of the great examples that you can see from the above in objective outcomes, not theoretic ROI, but real ROI back to their members, their community, as well as to the city themselves. With Dakota on the line, I obviously want to play uh, favorites, being uh, having a strong affinity for the state of Michigan as well as Detroit. And Detroit is one of our great examples as well, uh, as far as a city that really 
went back to the basics is trying to think about mobility, not just vehicular transit, which they have a, you know, a strong history in, and how they actually move all community members within the state and in the city into and out of the city by bus, by, by transit, by scooter, or by vehicle. And we help them to um, affectionately go on a renaissance, which is the kind of renaissance and sonic at great speed, uh, bringing them back to that great, um, you know, the great things that built the city uh, as far as the renaissance that they experienced back at the, you know, the, the dawn of that um, industrial revolution. We have a white paper we'd be happy to share through you, Albie and Connie, as it relates to this team on the outcomes um, that they delivered from this particular tool. And you can kind of see a really strong verbatim from Mark, the chief mobility and uh, uh, chief mobility innovation in the city of Detroit, highlighting that safety and responders. So it's safety at one side of the building and maybe first responders at the other side, but they get to benefit both of those things um, with only really a, about 60% of the intersections um, being covered by this particular set of technology that we've implemented. With that, I pass it back to you, Alby, and uh, thanks for the time today. Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. So, I mean, I think I feel like I love, I, I don't know if we did this on purpose, but the theme here around kind of urban mobility and the way that people move throughout cities, how cities manage that. And then now, you know, kind of at the tail end, Mike really kind of talking about how everything is being run as an ecosystem. I think this this conversation, I think, couldn't have gone better. And it's about one of my favorite topics um, and you sharing kind of the way that you responded to re Detroit's call on creating a solution, I think is important because that is the perfect caveat for the first question that I'm going to ask. Uh, maybe I, I want to get the municipal perspective, but I would love for the rest of you to kind of sprinkle in your wisdom in there. But how important is the public private partnership in the, the entire journey, right? It, the, the, the co-identification of the problem, the implement, the development and implementation of the solution. Like, what is that, you know, how important is that to a city and how, and the reverse, how important is it to an industry uh, to be able to have a city that, that can pinpoint that? But the public-private partnership approach, Brent, what do you think? I mean, how has that worked for you? Um, it could be on this specific topic or any. Yeah, for sure. No, I think it's very important. You know, as a city, we have to make good investments as we're spending tax dollars, right? We need that partner who understands not only the investment we need to make, but what we need to get out of that. Uh, operational impacts was mentioned in a previous session. And I think the partner needs to bring their experience and knowledge to the partnership, not to just sell that product, but they're selling and supporting that solution so that the city can realize the long-term benefits of their investment and integrate it into the day-to-day -day operations. So it it's it's really important and it's it's hard to find because it takes some time to to develop that trust right so i think these kind of discussions really help because as a you know as a as a city employee i'm looking out for the best interest of the investment and to see others that trust that partner already it helps a lot yeah well and i think i think you made a great point too is that it's it's not i mean obviously everyone has to generate revenue for their organization. And, and you know, we, we all have to survive and eat and thrive, et cetera, but it's not always about the sale, right? It's about listening to what the challenges are and partnering together to, to kind of co-create that perfect solution. And it could, it, it doesn't always have to be something that we have off the shelf. And sometimes it requires a little bit of ingenuity and, and partnership, but the, the ultimate outcome is the, the right solution and most times that's scalable. So that can that's kind of where the upside comes for, for industry. So gentlemen, if anyone wants to contribute to the to Brent's uh points there, feel free to just click on the raise hand and I'll and I'll call on you. If not, I'll ask the next question. Uh my hand's raised as soon as I can raise it. There it is. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> just a formality there. You can you can just jump in. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just wanted to, you know, first of all, thank Brent for, for being a fantastic uh, customer. But, you know, what we found is that no two cities are alike. Every city is different. They have unique personalities. They have unique characteristics. They have unique objectives. Of course, they all fall within, you know, an, an umbrella of, you know, there's some common threads. But and that's why it's really, really important to build that partnership. And yeah. uh, if you're going to have a successful outcome to a to a project, 
another element that, that Brent talked about, which is super important, is community engagement. Like we found that the cities that uh, realize this and, and go and, and devote effort and energy to uh, community engagement, that's where you get the real successes, you know, one plus one equals three, where you've got a very strong strategic partnership uh, with the city and you've got that community engagement so that it uh, uh, becomes a very successful outcome. So, Thanks for bringing that up, Matt, Dan. Uh, community engagement is a super key component into anything, right? You have to inform uh, and be transparent with the public about what you're doing. So I, I love that you said that. Um, and Mark, I think you wanted to sprinkle in some additional wisdom there too. I just wanted to say that, you know, I don't think we've done a system that's not bespoke either. You know, every city wants to have something in a different way and you have to design your system and not just one size fits all because it doesn't work. And really, whether it's our business or a municipality, you want to look at your partners because you're on a journey. And if your partners are and your suppliers are saying, no, we can't do that. No, this is how we only do it. That you're going to end up in that spot. You need partners people around you that are going, yeah, let's change it. Let's do this. Let's try this. Let's do a, a project. Let's be agile. Let's move. Agree. Yeah. I mean, it, again, it's not, it isn't a one size fits all. There is no one way of, of solving for something. And so I think that requires a lot of listening, right? As partners that, you know, it isn't always about driving our agenda or driving our solution. It's just kind of getting that inbound and synthesizing it and then coming up with the best path forward. Uh, so I, this is all music to my ears. Um, so now look, it, it is, and it's not always easy, right? And it's not always roses and things don't go well, you know, perfect. So what are some of the potential pitfalls and challenges that uh, you've either had, you know, you know to avoid or that you um, have encountered and have had to uh, overcome? Um, and maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll start with, um, with the industry folks on some of the challenges of working with cities and what you've had to do as an organization to overcome. And I'll take the, you know, but show, raise your hand if you want to chime in on that question. All right, our first brave soul, Dan. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna punt it to Mike because he didn't talk on the last one, and then I'll, I'll chime in after. I saw his hand go right. up simultaneously. There you go. Thanks, oh, thanks, Dan. Yeah, yeah, come on. Yeah, I think. Um, Gentlemen. Yeah, one of the things, Alby, that we talked about was just the sophistication of, of what would seem to be the most progressive or innovative cities uh, have also figured out the easiest, fastest way for success for themselves. And many of them have navigated or transitioned from, you know, buying in a traditional uh, CapEx model, kind of waiting for the budgeting cycle, waiting and competing for internal projects of innovation. So in this case, transit's competing with the fire is competing with splash pads is completing is competing pardon me with asphalt um versus really trying to think about how that center municipal agency or city is trying to solve problems for their members and for their communities and doing it in a way that allows them to get win wins uh through creative ways and many of these are also transitioning quickly from kind of traditional capex model like we've got this new money we've got grant money let's spend it now to really understanding how to transition that to more of an OPEX model where they can actually start to position this for growth and think about how this aligns more strategically to their long-term plans and investment. And I'm, even just the example I talk about with Detroit, they certainly are the beneficiaries of what we, we consider to be grants and kind of this new money, um, but they also need to do a really good job with discipline to tell a good story that they can lock those investments in for themselves uh, for five, 10, and 15 years. So our most sophisticated partners, we believe, leverage this OPEX model to kind of get a pilot started, be really adept to finding a partner or two to kind of get something off the ground. And I'm sure I can speak on behalf of the rest of the partners here from industry. We're always open for trying to think critically about, you know, pathways to partner and figuring out how to do things together to build utility. Great. Um, so just look, we've got, and, and Dan, I'm going to just cut you off on this one, just this one time. Um, but I think there was a good question from, from uh, the audience here is, you know, how do we ensure that what we're doing, uh, the, the data that we're collecting, uh, the video feeds, et cetera, like how do we ensure that we are uh, 
respecting privacy and we're being transparent. I think all of you mentioned it in your presentation is, you know, that, that uh, you know, you're, you're using it just for specific purposes. It's, it's public information. So what are, what are some best practices to ensure that, that what we are using uh, ensures transparency, security, privacy, et cetera? Um, and, and Brent, if you want to give this, the municipal perspective or, you know, any of the, our speakers want to address sure. it. Sure, I can just jump in there. So it's, it's a very good question. And that's why we were very transparent with all the businesses uh, right up front on why we were doing it. Because uh, one of the concerns was, well, you're using this for enforcement, right? You're not using this at all for, for parking availability or for studies. And so it was clear that we weren't you know, using it for that. I think around the privacy, uh, you know, video is is a touchy subject. Um, any city facility we have, we have the proper signage up. Uh, in a public area, it's hard. You can't get consent, uh, right? But I think it is just that transparency and you have to build the trust with all of the residents that, you know, this is the purpose, the only purpose we're using this data for, and that is the only purpose you're using it for. So having those policies and procedures in place to ensure that that is the only reason you're using that data for. Yeah, and I appreciate that because I believe cities are the stewards of resident safety and information. And so if you're setting that standard and that precedent for which our industry partners can operate, it makes it easier for them because they have the rails and they have the guidelines and they know what the expectation is. So I appreciate you as, as a local government saying that that is where that's the starting point and you build a solution off of that. So really want to recognize uh, your organization and all of our industry partners uh, for really focusing, I think it, it was mentioned in every part of the of in every presentation of uh, the importance of data privacy and security and information. So that being said, we are out of time. I think we could go on for hours. I think it was a great way to end our our series. Um, I want to thank you all for attending. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank Global Affairs Canada for for being a great partner uh, to this web series. Um, you know, I want feel free to engage with Smart Cities Council. Find us on our socials, online, on our website. We have a calendar of events. All kinds of great things happening throughout the year. Uh, Dakota, I don't know if you want to say maybe a couple of words very, very quickly before we uh, end the call. I truly a thank you to everybody. And, and please, uh, whether you're a participant or whether you're uh, just watching along with everything, think of this as a, a launch of, of where we can go and have more conversations like this. So, so let us know, be in touch of, of, of what would be the most useful for you to learn, to sell, to connect. Um, and, and we're here to try and partner with you. Amazing. All right. Thank you all. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks to participants. What a great way to wrap up the web series. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks a lot, everyone. everyone.